endeavor to justify Sandy as a biblical institution, I ask myself, is it possible that the Lord has brought me here at such a time as this? You know, to undertake a research conducted with scientific rigor and methodology, a research that can help to clarify the time, the place, the causes, the consequences of the change of God's holy day. You know, folks, the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the deeper the conviction became within my heart that I should dare to approach my professor, Vincenzo Monachino, and ask him permission to undertake this research. I remember the day when I went to visit him in his room because they received us in their little bedroom, which was also their office, very Spartan setting with their bed, their library, their little altar to pray, and their little desk. And I remember my professor, we had a special relationship. I was his right-hand man. I distributed all the syllabi, collected all the money, went up with him every day in this room. He, was, he came to love me as a son. And so I went to see, Professor, I have a question to ask you. Would you be willing to allow me to investigate the origin of Sandy observance for my doctoral dissertation without saying a word? He went to the shelf of his library, picked up a copy of the dissertation of Mosna, which he himself had directed, and he put it right under my nose. He said, we have just published a major study, and it's not the policy of the university to allow students to work in an area which has been amply investigated. Folks, I've been a literature evangelist for 12 summer <laughs> in Italy, in England, in the United States. Do you know what? I learned a lesson. You never take the first no for an answer, otherwise you never make a sale. Isn't it true? So I did not take the no for an answer. You know what I did? I opened my call porter briefcase. I pulled out all the books I've been reading, including the one of Mosna. I said, Professor, I read Mosna, I read Rordoff, I read Daniel Lu, I read Massey, I read all of these guys. And my conviction is that the final word has not been spoken. And if you were so gracious to allow me to re-examine all the biblical and historical material, I believe that we can come much closer to the truth. Will you be willing to help me? When he noticed my conviction and my determination, he said, why don't you go down to the academy, academic dean's office, state your objective, I will recommend your proposal for approval. And this is exactly what he did. I really want to thank God for being able to work at the feet of such a noble scholar, a man with a very high intellectual stature, a man that was willing to encourage the inquiry into truth rather than to protect the prevailing Catholic position. He knew that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was one of the, the two uh, professors who interrogated me on the day of my admission. He knew that he was going to take a risk, but somehow God gave him the courage to take the risk. And I want to tell you that not all the professors were of the same mind. Some professors were really very, what shall I say, hostile toward me. They did not see how in the world I would be allowed to be there. One of them told me one day, we were in Ravenna on a study tour with the Gregoriana. We were examining all of these ancient uh, sites. And I remember we were walking along the pavement of the street. And I told this professor, I was a bit naive, perhaps, some of the discovery that I made. I shared with him some of the papal decretal, which I found you know, indicating how the papacy went about leading people away from Sabbath keeping into Sunday keeping. I should have never done it. He changed the color. He became blue. I could tell that I had touched a sensitive nerve. And you know what he told me? If I'm ever going to be in the examining commission, I'm going to give you hell, ti darò l'inferno, mamma mia. We don't believe in hell, do we? But one thing we know that those Jesuits are sharpshooters. And if they want to boycott the work of the students, they know how to do it. And the threat of hell was not a comforting thought. While I was preparing for the defense of my dissertation, my wife can tell you that sometimes at night, I had nightmares. I was thirsting and turning. I was somehow, you know, having this nightmare of entering the defense hall and seeing this man, you know, really you know, attempting to, 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 to destroy the validity of my research. You know, and once you have spent five years, made a tremendous financial and, uh, and time investment, the thought of everything being blocked the last minute, you know, I didn't like to have to call President Hamill and tell 
him that I had to spend another year or two because uh, my dissertation had been rejected. So I want to give thank, I want to thank God for being able to work at the feet of such a good man. I'm only sorry to tell you that this man has been suffering for me. He passed away about a year ago. I was in Rome. I was hoping to see him on his deathbed at the critical care unit at the hospital. They would not allow me. They would not allow me because the general of the Jesuit order gave clear directive that he should never have any contact with me. Why? Because he was blamed for all the problems, for all of this negative denunciation from Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Costa Rica, and so forth, and Puerto Rico. Many of these Catholic leaders were fuming. For, for, for the university allow me to enter, study, research, and publish what they consider to be detrimental to their faith. And obviously, my professor made it happen. And so he's the one that was severely reprimanded. Now, my strategy was to discuss with my professor any significant historical or, or biblical document. Whenever I found something that was provocative for the Sabbath, I would go and show it to my professor. Professor, look what I found. And he would always take time to read it. And he would always say, mm, this is something to think about. This is something to think about. My aim was to gain gradual approval. You follow me? I didn't want him to give a knockout at the end. That would have been counterproductive. You follow me? And so whenever I found something exciting, I went to show it to him. Let me share you an exciting experience. One day I was searching for documentation on the early history of the Jerusalem church because the prevailing scholarly assumption, as you are going to learn, on Sunday morning uh, at, the, at the fifth and last presentation is that the Jerusalem church pioneered the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. Why? Who could do it? Not a small insignificant church. They claim only the apostolic authority residing in the Jerusalem church could accomplish such a change. So I went uh, to the library, to the Vatican archive, looking for documents shedding light on the early history of the Jerusalem church. And I found a very interesting account of the Jerusalem church by Epiphanius. He's a Palestinian historian who lived in the fourth century. And, you know, he gives the account of the uh, Jerusalem church of how the direct descendant left the city prior to the AD 70 destruction, went up to Pella, uh, colonized the place and he said that this direct descendant of the Jerusalem church insisted and persisted in the observance of the Sabbath until 350 AD. So when I went to show it to my professor, I remember the day when I went to see my professor with this document. By the way, when I found it, I jumped for joy. I asked the guy there at the Vatican, could you make a copy for me right away? You know the rule, you leave it with us today, you get a copy tomorrow. They, they are not in a hurry. They have been around 2,000 years. One day more, one day less. Doesn't make a scratch of difference to them. But when you are excited, you don't want to wait for 24 hours. So I gave him a little tip, a couple of thousand do lira, you know, which is about a dollar. And I said, Fratello mio, my dear brother, please accept this as a token expression of gratitude for your immediate service. And like in the creation story, spoken, it came into existence. A minute later, I had the document hot out of the copy machine. I went to show it to my professor. Professor, look what I found. What did you find this time? Why don't you take a look at it? It's Greek and Latin. And he said, do a letter what? Where did you find it? It was right here in your Vatican archives. I did not bring it from America for sure. And you know what he said? And you know what he said? Samuel, questo è il certificato di morte. This is the death certificate, the death blow to the theory that makes Jerusalem the birthplace of Sandy Kippi. Why did he say that? Because he was a bright guy. I tell you, it's a pleasure to work with Jesuits. They are bright people. You don't have to explain very much. You know, during the 26 years of teaching here at Andrews, I wish that all my students had been Jesuits, so I would not have to repeat myself so many times. You know, with the Jesuits, they catch on right away. He got the point. What is the point that he got? That if the direct descendants of the Jerusalem church insisted and persisted in the observance of the until the fourth century, then what? Then they could have hardly been responsible for changing the Sabbath to Sunday in the first place. Are you with me? Whoo! When I was able to prove to the satisfaction of my professor that um, Jerusalem was to be excluded, then I began my research in, on the possible role of the Church of Rome 
and I found the very important documentation which I will share with you in the fifth lecture. Now I found that this historical change from Sabbath to Sunday began during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian who reigned from 117 